gentlemen, welcome to the Legacy Wealth Show. Uh, host Tim Bratz. I have an awesome rock star guest, huge mentor of mine, and been a good friend of mine for many years, Mr. Mark Evans, uh, an entrepreneur in many different endeavors, and uh, one of the best business minds I've ever met. So I want inter to uh, um, introduce Mark. Mark, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Tim, for having me, man. Awesome, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to get into some, some conversations. We've obviously known each other for a long time, and um, I, I was introduced to Mark about four years ago when uh, I was banging my head against the wall as a solopreneur, trying to figure out how do people scale up their business? How do they grow this thing bigger? And uh, Mark invited me out to a mastermind event that he was hosting out in Vegas. And uh, it was about four years ago, uh, last month actually. Yeah. So go out, go out to Vegas, sitting in the room, gives me some super simple advice. It explodes my business. I, I uh, 4X'd my income that year and just put the right people and processes and focused on the right properties and, and product, I guess, um, to really scale up my business and, and get me to where my portfolio is today. So, man, I attribute a lot of that success to you and I really appreciate everything you've done for me, man. So I'm excited to, I'm excited to dial in and, and give as much value as possible to our listeners. And maybe, you know, uh, I've, I've given you a little bit of an introduction, but maybe you can give a little bit of your backstory Ohio guy and uh, have some real estate background, but many other businesses. So take a little bit of time and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, man. First of all, thanks. And also thanks for placing an ad on Craigslist. That's how we met. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not the weird section either, bro. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was not, it was not men looking for men, but it was, uh, it was real estate. <laughs> yeah, no guys. So a uh, small town, Ohio boy I grew up about an hour outside of Columbus, Ohio. You know, parents are amazing people. Just never really had fin financial means at a massive level. So I had to work on my mindset a lot. I, never, I barely graduated high school, never went to college, um, never read a book until I graduated high school, actually. Started reading a book. It was Think and Grow Rich. That was my first book I ever read. Um, this is when you actually had to go to the library and pull out the cards. A lot of people watching this might not even know what that is. But um, that's Good how I started. Decimal system. Yeah, exactly. So then I, you know, I, I grew up in a construction kind of environment. So it's like, what do you do? Well, I knew construction. So my goal in life was to make 100000 a year. And if I did that, I'd be rich and I could live any life I wanted. And that was my goal. So I set out to make hundred grand a year. And the way I thought about making hundred grand a year is like, how do I make 20 or $25 an hour? And then I just reverse engineered 100000 a year. How many hours do I have to work? And am I willing to make that happen? So it's very simple. $100,000 divide by 20, divide by 25. Let's go make money. And uh, then the next question is, what are you, what are you going to do? <laughs> so I've never had a real job in my whole adult life, a W-2 of any way, shape, or form. So it's either you kill it or you don't eat. And uh, if you can't tell, I definitely am eating, that's for sure. But uh, at the end of the day, for me, my first, my first buy was uh, June 21st, uh, 1996. I actually bought a seamless gutter company. That was my first company, um, you know, literally right out of high school. I met this guy, Larry, he was an awesome guy. I learned about owner financing and I owner financed a seamless gutter company, which was insane, $287 a month. I still remember to this day. And um, he's like, what do you know about gutters? I was like, water runs downhill. He literally put his hand out, shook my hand and I owned a company and the <laughs> phone was ringing off the hook. Some interesting lessons, right? So I bought a company, an existing company. He got in a bad car wreck. So I understood the situation, bad car wreck, truck sitting there. He's getting tons of calls, like 20, 30 calls a day to do work. He can't do it because he can't climb ladders anymore. He's a little bit older, bad back now, and truck's just sitting there, so it's a dead horse. It's making him zero money. So me coming and presenting and talking to him, um, I got, a, got the seamless gutter company. I'm doing all this work in gutters, hired two, three of my buddies back then immediately because you can't do gutters yourself typically. Um, and then everyone I was doing work for was pulling up in the Porsche, smoking cigars, saying, hey, man, you know, can you get this other job, do this other job, and they're paying me. And I'm like, what do you do? And they're like, real estate investing. And I'm like, okay, after a couple of people say that and they're all paying me and they're all growing, I'm like, I need to be doing investing. So I started learning about investing. Uh, went to a three day, uh, yeah, three day seminar from TV that we've all seen. Invested every dollar I had to go down to Florida for three days. And literally one thing changed my life. I was sitting in front of the room. There's about 65 people in the room. I saw the guy that I was there. This is newspaper days. He was in a newspaper. He made a phone call. And the lady said, I'm, I'm going through a divorce. I'm just done. I'm selling. I'm out. And he's like, let's jump on the bus and go buy this house. And I said, I can do that. And what was interesting, all the older people were saying, oh, this is staged. You know, all their pessimistic, oh, this is staged. There's no way it's that easy, this and that. And I'm like, we just saw him do it. What are you talking about? So 
that, that was a big thing to me. I, I didn't have any competitors. I, I just wanted to go back to the room and start making calls. Um, but then it grew, you know, I, I was learning about owner financing because I had no money. I had no credit. I was 18 years old. And then ultimately what happened, I just started doing buying properties, owner financing um, and started growing that job, not business, by the way, I wasn't a business for a long time because I didn't realize there was a difference, but I was working. I was, I, I'm a mule, right? Just work, 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 work until I die or quit. And then I realized as through this journey, I almost went bankrupt twice in my early 20s. Uh, made a lot of money and spent a lot of money, a lot more money, made a lot of money, spent a lot more money. But then started realizing I didn't want to learn just about how to make money in real estate, but how to grow a business, how to become a better leader, how to become a better driver of companies, how to build a real company. What does it look like? What should I be looking for? How should I market investing in marketing? You know, it's always funny to me. People say they have a business and every, all their business comes from word of mouth. Well, that's not a business. That's a death trap. Um, and again, you can make some good money doing it maybe, but you're not going to ever get free and rich and wealthy and build a legacy for what the show's about legacy wealth. So, you know, fast forward to now 20, what, almost 23 years now later, I, I own multiple companies. They generate massive amounts of money, which is insane. I, I'm still amazed by it today. Um, very humble on that. But the truth is it's not even near as close as where we're going. Um, uh, I feel like we're just starting every day. I feel like it's a new venture. Um, and a lot of people depend on us. So if not me, then who? Yeah, I know. Um, but that's where I'm at now today. I love it, man. Yeah. I, I love, I think, I think that why not me attitude is something that some of the, the best business minds I know encompass, right? It's like, if this guy can do it, I'm going to get rich doing this, right? If this guy's getting rich, I'm going to build straight wealth. Yeah. And um, I see that once in a while. And I, and I know that like a lot of us go through this, this phase of, you know, you feel like you got to like do all the work. You feel like you got to get kicked in the mouth. You feel like you got to earn your dues. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it got to the point for me at least where I was like, fuck that, man, I'm done earning my dues. Like it's about, it's my time now. Like I need to earn, like it's, I deserve this. I know I've paid my dues. I know I'm worth more. And, and I think you just like, you draw a line in the sand eventually and you get to that kind of mindset. It's like, I'm going to do this. Cause I, why not me? Why, why, why is that guy better than me? You know? Um, do you ever go through like a phase like that? It sounds like you did a little bit, right? Yeah, man, listen, I, I, you know, I was very aware of it. Like when I was 18 years old, sitting in that room, I'm looking around, mm -hmm. I'm like, why not me? You know, I didn't really know what that's meant at that moment, but I was like, why can't I do this? Or how, yeah. how do I do this? And, you know, I think a lot of people are asking a different question, very similar, you know, like, you know, how, do, like, why would that work? How does that work? As opposed to why not me? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like, how does it work? Because you made the phone call. That's how. Uh, how does it work? Well, because you showed up and ran the ad and people are calling you. Like, there's a lot of differences in that conversation yourself. The big transition for me, Tim, though, was October 8, 2005, when my grandmother died. Mm -hmm. Right. Truth is, if that didn't happen, I might, I probably would not be here today because I was just working. You know, I wasn't afraid of work 16, 18 hours a day. I actually like it. Um, and I loved it. So, but that moment just clicked on me. I was 27 years old. I had a, a you know, aha, aha moment. And I'm like, life is short. And I went to my office. I cried for a while, tried to figure out what I wanted to do when I, you know, I had money, but what I, I didn't have time. I, I was putting the time in to make more money. And um, then December 31st, 05, that's actually when my girlfriend, now my wife, Dina and I, went on that trip. We actually, you know, traveled around the country and world for seven years, mm. you know, so to build, why building companies. So, but yeah, why not me? Like, why can't I travel? Why can't I build a business? Why can't I buy 5,000 units? Why can't I a grow a business to 20 million, a hundred million or whatever the number is, right? So, so tell me a little bit about what that transition looked like when your grandma passed away and you're doing all the work yourself, right? You don't really have a team built or systems built and you go and travel the world for seven years. You say that to somebody and they're like, no friggin' way. I, I, dude, I remember when you called me from the Craigslist ad that I posted on that package of properties, you were on your honeymoon with D and you were in Hawaii for four weeks. And I think Bora Bora for another two or three weeks after that. And I was like, I'm doing everything right. I'm, I'm collecting rent and I'm doing all the work and I'm seeing contractors and um, leasing units, finding units, raising money, doing all that stuff. And I, I don't know how the hell to get out of my own way, right? So I call you and that was like mind boggling to me that you could go and take six weeks off and, and do something crazy. Like, dude, I'm, I'm going to Spain for a month next month, right? Because of the things and, the, and these, these types of, uh, uh, you know, 
the things that you learn and, and how you build business the right way. And so tell me what the transition looked like when your grandma did pass away. Obviously, I know how much she meant to you and that, that had to be really, really tough. Um, but it, it also helped you reflect back on life. What does it mean? Um, what does legacy mean? You know, that kind of, those kinds of questions. And as you're reflecting on that and looking to build your business, can you, can you speak a little bit more to what were the things that you put in place to help build a bigger business to then create that legacy type wealth? Yeah, man, I think it's a great, it's a great question. First of all, I think the biggest thing is, you know, every successful person I know is very grateful, right? I have a lot of gratitude for everything. Even my grandmother dying, I'm very grateful. I got to be able to tell her goodbye, for example. Right. So, and, you know, looking at the situation and saying, I don't know everything. You know, a lot of times I talk to people, they think they know everything, but they can't pay their electric bill. You know, it's like, I mean, a lot of smart people that don't know how to make money and, uh, but they know everything. Um, so power of gratitude and reflection, you know, so I, I don't really go backwards a lot in my mind because it's, it's, there's really, I can learn. I, I'm learning and using, learning and using. I'm not necessarily stopping and thinking 10 years from now, but keep in mind, right back then in 05, 06, I mean, this is real estate. I did have a team in Columbus. I had an office building. I had some staff there but systems were non-existent. I made a lot of weak people look strong, right? Cause I'm listening to their phone cause I'm like, give me the call, I'll close the deal. And I closed the deal, made me feel like Superman. They made, they felt like they were doing something great. I was actually hurting them and me, right? Cause I was taking, I was giving them power and pulling it right back from them when they had actually hit a little bit of resistance on a close. And you know, without me, it didn't, you know, I was the glue that held everything together. So when I left, this is flip phone days, you know, and faxes, I would travel with a fax machine, literally. <laughs> You know, because this is how you transacted business. You didn't have DocuSign and right signature and everything we have now. But um, I, the transition for me was more of making a commitment to do something. I, I literally, my first commitment was 30 days. All right, if you've ever been in Ohio from Janu December 31st to January 31st, it's a little chilly. So I was going to South Beach, Florida for one month just to try it out. I was committed to 30 days and then 30 days became a lot of years and uh, just kept growing. But the constraints forced me to get better. I lost half my team almost immediately, right? Because Mark's not here to make me look better. So everyone leaves or gets fired, mostly. I think we had four people left, the assistant, uh, Vanessa, and two other people kind of helping us. But ultimately what happened, I got rid of the office in June of 06 and just said, hey, guys, we're going virtual. No one didn't even know what virtual meant. We're working from home, actually. We didn't call it virtual. Um, and then it's like, how do we do what we want to do without being present in an office and beating each other up? I mean, we were scaling chaos every day. Um, you know, we've all been there, right? Um, I might be there today. Who knows? Yeah. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, for me, the transition was really making the mindset. It's all my, everything we're talking about, by the way, right, is mindset. 100%. Um, it's just really realizing how grateful you are to be where you're at today. If you're listening to the show, you're, there's a reason you're listening to it. And, <clears throat> and just being present, you know, being real with yourself and saying, I don't know everything. I need help. And just, you know, just taking your ego out of the situation. Love it, dude. So one of the things you're really, really good at, Mark, is thinking big and thinking bigger and thinking a few steps ahead. So you said that you don't, you, you don't think 10 years down the road, but, but you do think, you think down the road, but that's not like what, how you set your goals and stuff, right? That's, that's always been an interesting thing in me watching you. Well, what's helped you, one, think bigger, and two, how do you set goals and how do you make sure that you're on the path that you want to be on longer term? Yeah, man, the biggest way <clears throat> for me to think bigger is get around people doing bigger things than me, right? So if I, I call it the king of the dipshit mentality. If I'm rolling with everyone doing the same thing I'm doing, we're going to all cap out, but someone's going to be the king of the dipshits in the group. And I'm going to be looking up to them and they're making maybe 10 grand more a year than me or whatever the number would be, right? If you're making 50, everyone's making 50. And then some guy rolls in and making 55 a year. You're like, dude, you got it made, you know, whatever. <clears throat> um, and I'm not knocking. It's just a reality of the situation. So the guys, I, you know, these are why masterminds are important. These are why events are important. You're going to meet guys that are making so much more money. Um, I was always kind of a, it was always a, a big thing for me to go to like the big, nice steak houses you know, and see what people are wearing, what kind of watches, what kind of cars. Yes, this is materialistic, but that's what drove me. That's kind of what I thought success was in the beginning is materialistic things. Like, like, I don't know about you, but I get excited by driving by amazing houses. Like in Florida, mm -hmm. they're everywhere. So very materialistic. The houses are 50, $60 million. Like, wow, someone can own that. Why can't I, you know, getting on a yacht for a week, 
how does someone buy this and live on this for a year? And, you know, mm -hmm. just asking questions and challenging yourself and not, and, and you know, some of this stuff you can't even talk to your parents about because they're like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, be grateful for what you have. Well, who says I'm not? <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> all these crazy things. But again, we're talking about mindset, right? So for me, it's like, I'm thinking more about, you know, my biggest, scariest place in life is being comfortable with where I'm at, you know, comfortable as a person, not necessarily financially, but as a person, I want to grow, expand, push the boundaries. How do you buy a jet? How do you buy the cars? Mm -hmm. How do you buy the houses? How do you have multiple houses? Like I have multiple houses. I'm still amazed that I'm able to do that. You know, we travel, however, and like, so to me, it's like, yeah, man, it's just a wild but, mindset. You gotta have but, a but what I love about you though, is, is, is that in this aspect is, and you say, I've heard you say this before. It's not about the material things. It's not about saying, Hey, I have a $40,000 watch. It's about looking at your watch and saying, man, I've had a sacrifice. I've had to go through some shit in order to get this watch. This is a reminder of all the adversities I've faced in my life that says, man, I got, I got past those adversities. It's more of a, it, it's a mindset shift than it is just about having fancy flashy things. You know, I think, I think that's really, really powerful for people to understand. Well, dude, people run, you know, Frank McKinney runs the bad water, you know, guys run the bad water. It's 125 mile trek in, you know, bad water in Arizona, I believe it is, or Vegas. But what happened, I mean, they, at the end, they get a belt buckle, you know, it's a trophy. It's a, it's a piece of success. Like I worked really hard to get this, you know, for the watch, for the houses, for the, to me, this is why I'm here. I want night. First of all, there's nothing in the thing that says you can't have nice stuff while you're growing and building. Right. right. And for some reason, and, and by the way, guys, if you're talking shit about people who have nice stuff, you're part of the problem. You are the problem. That's your mindset that's holding you back. You're saying, I want to get wealthy to create, leave a legacy, but anybody who has anything nice is, you know, full of shit or scam artists or this or that. That's how I grew up, by the way. I mean, I, everywhere I go, like, I want that Ferrari. Oh, who'd they rip off to get that? You know, and I'm like, we don't even know the person. How, who'd they rip? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> and the truth is, and you know this, Tim, because we meet a lot of successful, wealthy people, most of the time, the wealthy people are the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And they can actually help other people because they have resources and money and time. And, you know, when you're broke, I used to be broke. I didn't have time and resources and all that. I was so busy working mm -hmm. that I didn't have time to do the things I really wanted to do. Passion, legacy driven pieces. It's not about the money. It's about what money can do. What are, what are the impacts that money can make, right? What kind of influences and improvements can you, can you provide and, and offer like, I know you're, you're big into the philanth the philanthropic side of things and pay off layaways all, every single year at, at Kmart, Walmart, whatever. Um, and I know we're always donating and giving back and, and uh, helping out charities and all sorts of different people who fall on hard times. So it's, it's not about, it's not about the money. It's, it's the noble things that money can do. Oh. That's why, that's why we go and, and try to create this, this legacy wealth. Yeah, um, dude, just taking it on the personal level too. If I have money, I can actually be home with my kids. Mm -hmm. If I have money, I can actually have my wife stay at home with the kids. If I have money, we can hire a babysitter or a teacher or whatever to be home with the kids while the wife and I are out hanging out, enjoying life. They're, so it's like, you know, again, these are all, these are amazing benefits that money, <laughs> by the it, way. It gives you options, right? Yeah. Now you have options to do whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, with whoever you want to do it with, right? It just... It, it gives you more opportunities and more options to um, live a more fulfilled lifestyle anyways. So um, tell me a little bit about how you do set goals. Uh -huh. um, I, I mean, you say that you don't look out 10 years. I know you, you do like 12 month goals though, right? I mean, yeah. I, I realize, you know, every time I do set long-term goals, I'm changing them, right? Because they're living, breathing, like thing, right? It's its own organism almost that other opportunities shift, other opportunities provided like up here and you end up going down a different path. So I understand why people don't put long-term things in place. But for me, it, it helps to have like a destination in mind and then be able to like reverse engineer my path in order to get there. Um, so I do have something, hey, here's where I want to be on a holistic level, maybe, you know, 40 years from now. Um, but how do you, how do you set your goals right now? Help the teams get bigger. That's really my goals in life now. You know, obviously I have health goals, <clears throat> you know, like, Hey, I'd like to be down 20 pounds by the end of 2019. That's a goal to me. That's a very big goal. And then there, you got to create the path to get to the goal. The truth is I think a lot of people set very low level goals per year. I like to have big goals per month. To me, the monthly goals are much more attainable because it gives me a lot more focused. I think a lot of times people set the 12 month goal, they feel like they can do it. And then what do they do? They wait for the last month to do it. 
Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, I, I'm very now. And Tim, you, you and I are like, the, we're all, every successful person I know is now. We're very urgent. Like, we, we got to go. I'm not patient. Mm-hmm. I got to go. Shut up. Where are we at? Let's go. How do we get there? Let's go. Okay, well, this is breaking. Let's fix it. Let's go. We're very solution driven, mm-hmm. you know, and we know there's going to be problems and all that stuff, but like, let's get it done now. Like, there's hacks and all this. How do you lose 20 pounds in a year? That's, that's a very grueling process in my mind how to lose 20 pounds in a month, two months, three months. I can manage that mentally. I can understand it, wrap my head around 90 days of hard workout effort and then create a lifestyle inside of that for the next 12 months or nine months or whatever. So for me, business wise, I'm more looking like how to multiply my efforts. Like, okay, I want to make 10 million a year in this company, but how do we get to 30? You know, I'm more challenging the thought process of where we're at to where we're going and then more casting that conversation onto the team to have them help me find the answer. Cause right. Truth is if I knew the answer, we'd be doing it already. Mm-hmm. So it's more empowering them I, I, coming up with that big picture, you know, semi attainable, but still a stretch goal, but also forcing it through conversation with the team. I love it. And yeah. speaking of team, you're one of the best at building yeah. teams, man. Talk, talk to me a little bit more about how you screwed up building a team and how you've gotten better at building a team and some of the lessons learned in that whole process. Yeah, man, again, because I, you know, I grew up kind of not a lot of money around me. So every time I heard people talking about hiring people is how do you pay them less and give them more to do? (laughs) So the mule, that's what I was taught. So I lost a very amazing person in my life and business um, that I literally would pay her less, say, oh, we had a bad year. I got to pay you less, but I'm going to give you more to do. And ultimately that lasted six years and she left and she, um, she should have left probably two years deep. But now what I've realized is like, the real question is, and this is the difference between, you know, this is like anything, by the way, this is like price tag checking. Like you go to the store, you are like, I want to buy that. And then you look and you're like, oh my God, $80 for a shirt. There's no way I'd ever pay that. And then you flip it and then you go buy the $20 shirt. So it's same thing with hiring people, like understanding what their value is, not what their cost is. Mm-hmm. If you understand the value in an individual and you pay them 50 or hundred grand a year, or whatever the number is, you're looking at that as a value that they're going to bring value to the company and generate more revenue. You know, if I, if I the question is, do you want to spend 50 grand a year to get 50 grand back? Or do you want to spend a hundred grand a year to get 10 million back or a hundred thousand or a million back or whatever? And the higher you pay typically, not always, but typically you're going to get better quality, better value dollar for dollar exchange. So now I'm thinking more of how do I pay my team more, give them more benefits and bonuses, make their life easier. Stop being a micromanaging maniac, which I used to be like, where's this at? What's going on? Like constantly in their business, as opposed to like, here's the cat, here's the vision. Here's your task and roles and responsibilities. Now go do it. Call me if you need anything. And now when you do that, you kind of empower other people to help lift you up. And it's really worked well. I mean, obviously I still have challenges with that. Um, and you got to let go of good people sometimes because they just kind of change their core values. Um, right. Cause they could, they could watch me. Like when I was building my team, I was traveling in amazing five-star locations, you know, on everywhere in the world. And the team could be like, well, he's traveling. I'm making him money. Why am I doing this? You know, but like, I built a culture around like, guys, I've worked really hard to get here. I'm actually, when I'm not working, I'm working just yep. like you can. Yep. So, absolutely. And, and, and I found that <laughs> like when you attract that higher talent, when you go after that, that higher talent, it, it removes everything. Like they're so solution oriented, like you had just mentioned that they're going out and solving problems, not even bring Hey, Mark, don't even worry about it, dude. And they rip the ball out of your hand and they run down the field with it. Like that's the type of a players you want on your team. And, and it's been, it's been absolutely life changing for me over the past couple of years, as I've kind of oriented my business to attract these multiple six figure people. The, the issue is, I think a lot of people, you know, when they're, when they're doing zero to a million bucks in revenue, it's kind of a proof of concept phase, right? Like, does this work? Let me make sure I can make money doing this. And then we get to this phase where it's like doing a million to maybe 10 million in in revenue and you're making enough money where it creates a good living and you can build a sort of a team, but, but not enough money where you can attract multiple six figure a year talent. Right. And so for me, I had to kind of make a shift in that let me pay you a base salary and then give you profit share based on how well the company does that way people, um, they're, they're, they're not stressed over, over money, but at the same time, they're not content either. You know, these are high performers and then they get paid a, a, a big chunk of profit share based on how well the company does. Some, some of them even have equity in my, in my uh, properties or in my company. And now they're motivated. The company makes, you know, $6 million net this year and they have 10%, they get a $600,000 bonus, right? So like there's, there's some serious, 
um, uh, consideration there in order to help push the company to reach those higher levels. And it was a way that I was able to kind of attract better talent without having to take on the, uh, uh, you know, the price tag of that higher talent and build it out that way. But it is a game changer when you're able to, um, attract those, those high a player, you know, high level, uh, employees. You know, change your life. And the problem, again, all this stuff we're talking about is the individual that's hiring though you have to realize that you're the problem. If you keep having bad hires, it's because of you, not because of them. Like there's gotta be a, so ultimately you like look up, you're like, I've hired 12 people and they all suck. Well, maybe it's you, you suck because you're the one hiring them. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day too, right? I, I mean, it's, it's so powerful guys. It's a game changer for sure. If you can get this dialed in. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, I hired an, uh, an outside HR chief HR director, my buddy Scott that I told you about. And uh, this guy's got 950 employees, his private equity firm goes around to different businesses. They buy businesses, they fix them all up, put better systems and processes and people in place, and then let them cash flow. I was like, dude, I do exactly that, but with apartment buildings. Can you help me bring on some better talent? And, um, and what I realized is exactly what you said, Mark, is like, I suck at hiring people. Like, I, I, it's just not it's not a strength of mine. And so I don't like doing it. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. So then it's like anybody who raises their hand, you got a job, right? Come on in. You're hired. Here, here's your list of tasks to do. And, and I don't want to train you either because I don't want to spend that much more time. Right. Yep. And, and when I, when I brought him in, I realized like there's people and you're really good at this. This, this is, I think your unique ability when you, when your core, um, highest and best uses of your time is, is finding the right people for the right seats. I think you do an amazing job at it and, and, and ask yourself, who can I hire to then take that problem outside of, of from me having to do it. Right. Um, what, what do you say? Like, uh, find the who to do the how or find the who to do the what, right? Yeah, Find the who to do the how. I mean, that's a Dan, uh, Dan Solomon quote, but like, he, you know, that's the truth is like us in the beginning where you can't grow a big business with a small mindset. Right. So, what gets you to a million is not going to get you to 10. I promise you that there's no way it happens. If it did, everyone would be running to a million dollars. Including the people, right? Who got you to a million. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you're going to have to change your team infrastructure, you're going to, to team up, you know, staff them up. You got to push them harder. You got to grow. You got to show a bigger vision, bigger core values. There's a lot there. I mean, to make a million dollars a year in a business is way easier than moving way beyond that. But mm -hmm. you know, who to do the how, like in the beginning, we have to learn how to do everything because that's what we think we need to do. By the way, this is what's wrong with school systems is everything's got to sit down, shut up, and figure it out on your own. Don't ask questions. If you do, you're a dummy. The truth is, this is called collaboration. If you learn how to hire people, I'm always thinking about how to hire people, like you said, Tim, always thinking about that. That's all I think about because every hire I get, I make more money. Every hire I get, the team grows bigger and stronger. Every hire I get, the higher level they are, the, you know, we're, we're letting go of the weakest link in the game if they don't pull up. So we're constantly seeking better, better people all the time. You, you've alluded to that a couple of times in our conversation is, is spending money on marketing always yields a return. Spending money on people always yields a return. Those two things in your business are always an investment, yep. right? As long as you're hiring the right people and doing the right marketing, right? Yeah, but if it's not a return, you're learning from it, right? So right. like when, especially if you're looking at your first hire, depending who's watching this, if you don't have a hire yet, like your first hire, you got to be thinking, you know, you're going to learn a lot in that. Like you did, Tim, like we all do. Like when we hire someone, our first hire, we're like, oh my God, I'm going to mess this up. You know, we all look at it as an expense. Again, we forget the value, what they bring to the table, especially when you're looking at the financial investment. But like if it's, say if it's 36,000 a year, it's only $3,000 a month. And then you can break that down to weekly, daily, if you want, depending. But just think if someone could give you an extra 40 hours of your life per week, what does that work to your company? Mm -hmm. That's what a $36,000 or 50,000, depending where you live, assistant could do for you. Mm -hmm. They're going to do consistent things. They're going to be focused. They're going to give you direct, like, and not only that too, Tim, right? We step up when we hire someone because we got to become more conscious. We got to become more accountable to the system because we actually have people now depending on us. Mm hmm yeah, it's powerful stuff. And I, and I remember sitting in that mastermind. That was, that was the advice you gave me. You're like, dude, you got to get out of your own way. You got to hire an assistant ASAP. And for me, I was like, dude, I just made six figures for the first time the previous year. Like there's no way that I can, um, you know, bring on an assistant and pay them essentially 33% of what I just made. And uh, you're like, dude, don't look at it like 35 or 40 grand a year. Look at it as three grand a month, right? So you invest for two months, total of $6,000, See 
how it opens up your life, see how, how it opens up your ability to go and spend time on, on higher revenue generating activities and, and even the, the intangibles, right? Being able to go spend time with the wife and the kids and those kinds of things. And, um, uh, and I remember like making that decision. I, I did it in March 1st, 2015, hired an assistant the next 10 months. I made four times as much money as I did the year before. And it was, um, it was insane. It just by that, that single, then almost, you, you almost become like addicted to it, right? And you're oh. like, who else can I hire? Who yeah. else can I put in place? I had five employees by the end of that year. So I love it, man. No, it's powerful stuff, man. Um, so, so this is legacy wealth podcast, obviously a lot of business orientation. We we're, we're real estate guys. So we're going to be talking about real estate. Tell me about just like general financial advice. What's some good financial advice that you've learned over the course of your life or, or something that uh, you got, you got Marco who's um, three going on four this year. Right. And then you have uh, um, the new baby do any day now. Any so day. super excited about that. Tell me about um, one, uh, uh, here, here's the bigger questions. What does legacy mean to you? And then I want to talk a little bit, no, I'll, I'll dive into something else after that. So what does legacy mean to you? Yeah. So legacy means, so like for me, my driver is breaking the financial, um, problems that my family has had their whole life. Right. So I want to leave the family better off. My mom and dad did an amazing job raising me with manners and all that, but financially, I didn't learn anything from them except how to go to work and make a, a paycheck and complain about my job and repeat process. So legacy to me is like, what, like I saw my grandfather die in a nursing home. I will never die in a nursing home. I'm going to make so much money that I'll be on a 25, in a $25 million house overlooking the ocean with people t changing my diaper if I have to. Like that's kind of stuff that drives me, I think about. Yeah. Um, for me, legacy is about you know, not giving my son and my other child everything, but giving them the tools to be successful and be a great steward of time, money, and energy um, to people and causes that we care about. You know, because once you get to a certain level, and we all know this, once you get enough cash flow, it really becomes, you better have a bigger driver than just money, because mm -hmm. if not, you're going to be, you're never going to be satisfied or happy. So legacy to me is just really putting my arms around conversations, doing it day to day, living it, eating it, sleeping it, and leading by example to my, myself, my family, and people you know, around me. Like I just want to be a better leader. So to me, it's stewardship, man. I think we all got to be thinking about how to give more and because uh, there's a lot of takers out there. So I'm, I'm really thinking about stewarding the money. It's a learning process, though, man, because right, I got 18, 20-something years of deprogramming from how I grew up, right? Everyone's like, you know, you know, money is the root of all evil, this, that, like, so you fight that all this time. Mm -hmm. you got, that's why you got to surround yourself around great people making a lot more money than you, how they protect it, how they grow it, how they manage it and all that. So for me, that's what legacy means to me, man. It's powerful, man. Powerful. So what are you doing to instill? Uh, Cause it sounds like obviously guys like us, we're going to be able to pass down significant amount of wealth to our kids and to future generations. And, and that's powerful. But, um, we know that it's the education, right? That's, and, and, and the, um, the knowledge and the mindset that's far more valuable than the actual tangible stuff, right? And so what are you doing um, to teach Marco about building wealth, about finances, about um, you know, getting in the mindset of these things to make sure that, that he's you know, growing in a way where he doesn't have all those negative thoughts about wealth and money uh, for the next 19 years. He's going to, he's got a, a, an awesome head start, right? So what are some of those things that you're working with him on? Well, I mean, dude, I think it's just, but you know, one, he's three and a half, right? So you can only have so many in depth, deep conversations yeah. with a three and a half. But for me, it's like leading by example. I mean, he's, shit, he's three years old. He's been on multiple yachts, multiple private jets, multiple amazing locations and vacations and all that. So for him, his norm, it, you know, what, when you're, when your dream becomes your normal, like it really is, it's crazy. I, I still am amazed by that. But for him, like, you know, like, hey, you know, what does daddy do? Hey, like more importantly, I'm leading by example. I'm up at 444 in the morning. I'm doing the work. My conversations every day are about money, what money can do for us. Not it's a problem, but how mm -hmm. do we get more? Strangers aren't danger. Stranger danger is not. Every stranger, I think uh, Grant's famous for saying, strangers have my money. Strangers got what you want, right? Like they have properties, they have houses, they have companies, they have problems, solve their problems, become solution oriented. So I'm talking to them when we go to tip, right? I've always had Mark grab the bill, right? I want him to get accustomed to grabbing the bill and looking at the numbers and saying, Hey, daddy's giving a good tip. Did she do a good job or not a good job? You know, like 
just having conversations with him that are going to be progressive. Like I know when I used to go to the thing, it's like, Hey, we're only getting two pizzas. This is all we can do, you know, yeah. which is awesome. Again, I'm not knocking it, but it was coming from a lack of not an abundance factor. So this is all abundance mentality, right? So, you know, when I'm sitting down there, Mark, you're the greatest, you can be whatever you want to be, you know, but again, I, I think what people has got to be careful though, is when you tell your child, you can be whatever you want to be and you're not being whatever you want to be. There's an incongruency factor to that. Mm -hmm. They're eventually going to wake up and call bullshit on that to you. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent watching this or someone that's leading people, you better take note that it's not about, because right, we've all heard, do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. That only goes so far. So Mark, you know, like leading by example, tipping properly, holding the door, saying, yes, ma'am. Like trying to teach him manners at a massive level that my parents taught me and uh, just giving them, you know, financial knowledge. Dude, he, he's got such a massive head start. Like I literally, Same. especially technology, by the way, right? Technology is just zooming along. Financially, he's better off than I ever was. Like, but again, my money is my money, not his. So he's going to have to earn it, work for it, understand it, appreciate it, and steward it properly if he ever so, wants a dime from me. So we've all, we've all seen the kids who, um, who grew up in money. This is, this is one of my big challenges right now is trying to figure out how to make sure that my kids know that they, ha they can do whatever they want. We're pushing the limits and we're, um, they, they have the ability to do anything, right? And, and I'm trying to, be, again, be that good steward, be that, that um, mentor to my children and, and uh, be that, that, that person, right? So, so at the same time, though, we've all seen the kids who grew up with a lot of money, who were never had the responsibilities, and all of a sudden they turn to drugs, they turn to being total shitheads, and you see them on, on – television now, right? Um, are there any concerns there? Or, or how do you, how do you combat that? How do you, how do you take a look at that and make sure that Mark's going to be an awesome uh, person? Obviously you're, you're teaching him on the manners and that kind of stuff. Um, is there anything that you're doing to kind of like say, Hey man, this, this is your reality, but it's most people, not most people's reality. Like this is what most people have to deal with. This is why you need to be, gra uh, you know, have gratitude and be thankful for all those kinds of things. Well, how, how do we, how do we balance that? And I'm asking as a, as a friend as yeah. trying to figure this thing out too, you know? Oh, dude, listen, I, I don't think anybody's got it figured out. I think people can say they got it figured out, but the truth is right. We could grow up in the same house and three people and all three people could be so different, right? Mm -hmm. Drastically different. I think at the end of the day, it's well, it keeps me up at night and gets me up early. Like, I don't want to raise a shithead. I want to raise someone respectful to the world and to himself. Probably the biggest thing is like, I think about is probably the best thing we could do is teach a kid how to be happy. You know, no one can like, especially when they're young, right? They're in high school or kindergarten or whatever. And kids are picking on them. It's like, daddy, they're being mean to me. It's like, well, they're, that, that's on them, not you. They're just being mm -hmm. jerks. It is what it is. You know, like I, the problem is too, I think the world's pussified children. You know, they haven't let them get beat up. They have like where I grew up, dude, you get in a fist fight. That's what you do. That's how you solve problems. And you get whacked a couple of times. Like, Ooh, that doesn't feel good. I better straighten up. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, you know, as he's growing and developing, I definitely want to teach him what real happiness is. Cause we do live in a materialistic world. It's only getting bigger. Right. So mm -hmm. let's say, and again, this is at all levels. I know a guy, he, you know, he has, his families are like hundred million dollars plus are worth. He's a lawyer for them. Parents die, kids, you know, get all this money. But as the kids are never happy, you know, because they're, they're looking for something that's not real, you know, bigger cars, bigger houses, all this stuff for just the stuff It will never make you happy. It's never going to fill the void of your dad not being around mm -hmm. all the time when he can be or your mom or whoever. So for me, being present, be acknowledging the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between and having a real conversation about happiness. Like, dude, I want Dude, I don't care if he was a ballerina dancer. It's not an idea in my mind, but if he did it, I don't care. I'm supporting him at, I'm going to give him the best teacher. I'm going to give him the best outfits, the best shoes or what, you know, whatever. Like that's to me, if he's happy, I think everything else will take care of itself ultimately. Mm -hmm. Cause do we meet adults that are not happy? Like in our world and they grew up in a different era. So like, what are, why aren't they happy? Like I'm happy. Dude, I'm happy if I'm sitting in a trailer or I'm happy if I'm sitting in the mansion. Mm -hmm. I'm happy because I know there's more. I know I can do better. I know it's no one's fault, but my fault. Right. So I think that too, taking full responsibility for every single thing, good and bad in life, mm -hmm. which yeah, we all do. 
That's, that's powerful. And I think, I think that was a big lesson to me, like, you know, playing that victim mentality and saying, I'm not where I want to be because of this or that or whatever. And like, when you take a hundred percent ownership of it, like you had mentioned on your employees and your team and your marketing and all these other different things. Um, I think, I think that is one of the biggest mental shifts people can go through is take 100% ownership. Well, you know, the market shifted and this and that. Well, Hey, you should, you should know better. Hey, I'm late to, I'm late to the office today because uh, I was stuck in traffic. Dude, you should have left friggin' 30 minutes earlier. You've never been in traffic before. Like, don't you know, like this is an important meeting that you need to be at and blah, blah, blah. And it's, um, I, I, I see that victim mentality. You could either be a victim or you can be a victor, you know, you can, you can rise up above any of that adversity and uh, take a hundred percent, know that, that you control the cards. Right. So, um, I think that's, I think it's powerful stuff, man. So, um, dude, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, is there anything else that, that you want to dive into that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah, man. I, I think one thing, one really big financial piece is you guys are here to create legacy. <clears throat> Probably one of the biggest lies we've all heard is cash is king, right? Cash is good, but cash flow is king, right? Mm -hmm. Picture, this is why lottery winners, why athletes go bankrupt eventually. Most, the majority, like mass majority for a lot of them is because they get a big chunk of cash and they don't invest in cash flow. Um, as you're growing and learning about financial wealth and legacy and security and et cetera, you got to understand, put your money to work. A million dollars in your bank account is doing nothing for you. A million dollars in a property that's producing 10 grand a month it's doing a lot. It's creating, you get depreciation factor, you get appreciation factor, you get cash flow. I mean, it's got a lot going for it. In, 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 even in companies, buying companies, you part, you know, take a percentage of it for some cash to give them some influx. But get your money working for you. Probably the biggest thing I discovered a long time ago is cash flow is king and you know, cash is queen. <laughs> it's good to have cash, but I, from my experience, I spend cash. But picture if you just had 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 a month coming in, Every single month, like clockwork, 30 days later, you spend it all day one, you get it right back, you know, but if you have a million and you spend it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's a mindset shift that I had a long time ago. And like, dude, it's a game to me. I'm always trying to figure out how to get houses for free by creating cash flow to pay for it, how mm -hmm. to take vacations for free by getting cash flow to pay for it, right? Instead of going and spending 25 grand on a vacation, how do I take X amount of dollars, call it, say if you get a 10% return, take 250, collect 10% on my money, and now I can take a free vacation every year, 25 grand a year, you know, mm -hmm. for example. But you could do this. this you, can, you can play games with it so it gets you excited. Because in the beginning, you're like, oh, $400 a month ain't going to do anything to me. Well, dude, if you can't learn how to invest and make cash flow with $1,000, you sure know how you're going to figure out with millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's like giving, right? You're not going to be a great giver if you can't give when you don't have much to give. Because mm -hmm. when you get a lot to give, you're not going to be a good giver because you're going to be scared to give. Mm -hmm. So this is a muscle we all got to get in the gym in our brain and start working this stuff out and really start asking. Our, we, we talk a lot about this, Tim, in the mastermind, thoughts on thoughts. Like, okay, why am I not giving? What's my thought on the thought? How do I get bigger? What's my thought? On, like all these things that we could do. But really, guys, cash flow is king. I guess that, that's, that's the point. <laughs> I love that. I love, you know, I mean, I mean, people think you, like wealth is just making more money. That's, that's like a third of the equation. One, you got to make money. Two, you got to keep money. Three, then you got to get your money working for you, right? In order to be able to, uh, you know, the whole thing, go and buy assets that then produce cash flow, like you're talking about, and then pay for those liabilities. And that way you can buy a liability, like you said, every month, every year, whatever that looks like, and never ruin, never risk that principal balance, you know? And actually that, like you were saying, that principal actually appreciates if you invest in the right types of assets at the same time. Um, that's powerful stuff. I'm really good at buying properties, buying assets that produce residual income. You're really good at building businesses that, that, and, and obviously you buy properties and stuff too, but I think that's a, a big insight for me, man. That's something that I haven't been able to figure out how to build the business that then produces. Although my, my business is, is decently passive for me now where my team's kind of running the, the passive income producing assets. But, um, what, what, what's been a trick for, for you on that side? Just again, surrounding yourself with the best people. Man, you know, it's interesting. I typically am doing the opposite of what most people are doing because I know the, you know, masses do something that you probably shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. and again, I'm, the thought is like, why are they doing that? Why are ever, why is why is this moving this way? What am I not seeing that they're because there's only a certain amount of people doing what we're talking about, <clears throat> you know? So yeah, but definitely getting around other people. I can tell you, everyone watching this, depending on 
where you're at in your life, how do, the question, first thing is how do you get a thousand dollars a month residual? Then how to get 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, start making it a game and mapping it out. And then let's say if you're 30 years old by 55, how do you have a hundred grand a month coming in passively through either companies that you've built or through jobs? And it takes the stress off of the action, the day-to-day -day work. You got to work. It, it takes the stress off of the work. Like Tim, you and I, we do not trade our time for dollars. Mm -hmm. Like we literally either make money or we don't. <laughs> like we're not saying, okay, I worked eight hours at $80 an hour. You owe me whatever. No, dude, like we work hundred hours. We might make zero, mm -hmm. but we're going to gain knowledge to go make the next deal better then mm -hmm. the third deal better and then the fourth deal better. Cause we're not quitting. Right. So at the end of the day, I think it really is like how to play a game with this. You gotta, you gotta get started though, whatever yeah. it is. Get started and then stay consistent, right? Yeah. Don't give up. Don't quit. Like, yeah. especially in real estate, like oh, I, I see people get involved in real estate and then they, they bail on it. I'm like, Dude, this is the most time-tested, wealth-building uh, uh, asset that you could possibly be involved in. Since the dawn of civilization, wealth has been measured in land ownership. Like, why would you ever go, like, why would you bail on that? You can't do it, man. You just got to stick with it. And, and it's like working out. I mean, obviously, we've been on this 75-day challenge. And, you know, the first, first 7, 10, 15, you know, 25, 30 days, you don't see any sort of results. Now you're working and working and working and working just like we do in our business and maybe not making money, not making money, not making money. And then all of a sudden, 60 days later, 90 days later, 120 days later, um, you know, nobody sees any results after 30 days. Maybe you see a few results after 60 or 90 days. And it's not until, you know, six months later that people are like, Mark, man, Hey, your, your face looks good, man. You've been losing a little bit of weight. You look a little bit, you know, more posture, dude. At, at, look at me. You're like, man, I've been working out every single day, blood, sweat, tears, crying outside in the snow, you know, inside doing two a days, eating exactly. healthy, like sacrificing daily for, for these results. And you're just now seeing this six months later, but that's life. That's business. That's, you got to put in the reps and then eventually over time that compound effect sets in and you just stick with it. And it doesn't need to be a, a Herculean effort right? Every single day, like, especially once you, that compound effects, that momentum starts kicking in, you just need to kind of keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Cause we're always growing or we're dying. Right. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I mean, at the end of the day, you're either consistent or non-existent for what we're trying to do. It's like, could you imagine if you showed up to your spouse inconsistently, like you do your business, where would you be? Mm. It wouldn't be, it'd be non-existent. You show right. up to your kids like life every day, like you do your business, where would you be? If you built, if you tried to build your legacy inconsistently, where do you think it's going to be? So I think it's really got to put some effort into it, gamify it. So it's fun for you to play the game of life of like buying an asset, learning from it. Even if you make money or don't make money, there's a lesson in it and then taking it. But, but again, this comes back to taking responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So you actually got to take responsibilities. If you want this, you'll do it. If you don't, well, you're going to be a victim and you're going to blame everyone else for what you don't have. Powerful stuff, dude. Yeah. Dude, I can't, I can't thank you enough for being on the, on the show. Excited that you're the first uh, guest on Legacy Wealth Show and um, super pumped for, dude, I've, I've seen you, you growing over the past four or five years. And uh, like you said, man, we're just getting started. So I'm excited to see where you're going to be five years from now and 10 years from now and uh, how we're going to build some Legacy Wealth together, brother. So um, dude, I appreciate you. What's the best way for people to kind of connect with you? Yeah, best way is either at markevansdm.com or follow me on Instagram at markevansdm. Awesome. Awesome, oh, dude. Well, hey, I can't tell you guys how much value this guy that Mark has, has provided for me um, in my life and how he's kind of helped direct and um, advise and counsel and mentor me in my business relationship. I know I wouldn't be where I am without you, brother. So, dude, I appreciate you. Thank you for being on the show. And, uh, dude, good luck with, uh, with the baby coming soon. I know it's uh, exciting times. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, buddy. All Have right, a buddy. Day, guys. Stay focused. <laughs>